He's already the Philippines' most powerful businessman. Today, he made the ultimate takeover bid for the nation's presidency. Welcome to the program. A tense waiting game has begun in Manila after today's national elections. The vote count started several hours ago, but with more than 87,000 candidates vying for office in three levels of government, the results could be days, if not weeks, in coming. In the all-important presidential contest, one of the front-runners is a man with some big wins to his credit on Australian racetracks, Eduardo Dunding Cuenco. Cuenco was Ferdinand Marcos's closest crony. He was at the former president's side when he fled in the face of Cory Aquino's people power revolution. His election would be a throwback to the Marcos era of unbridled privilege and patronage. For a start, Dunding plans to free up his own business assets, frozen under Cory Aquino, who is, ironically, an estranged cousin of the billionaire businessman. So how could a man of such enormous wealth and self-interest appeal to the downtrodden masses of the Philippines? Mark Colvin reports. It is Friday, the 17th of April, 1992. Good Friday. The world over, Christendom mourns the death of its saviour. Only in the Philippines do the people choose to recreate it so literally. A villager plays the part of Jesus, and his cross is real. A century of American influence has done little to erase 300 years of Spanish rule, a living tradition that reaches back all the way to the Middle Ages. The modern world is not used to such brutality. This is only an hour's drive from Manila, but the Philippines, for all its modern image, is still the product of a medieval heritage. It is religion which dominates the lives of the vast majority. And the majority are not sophisticated city dwellers, they are the rural poor. The blood, too, is real. Here, the life, like the religion, is a medieval cycle of suffering and atonement, sin and forgiveness. As in the time of the Spanish conquest, the vast mass of the people are poor and landless. Officially, the church frowns on these rituals, but the rural poor pay no heed. For the majority of Filipinos, the structure of this society remains an essentially feudal one. Voting is more a matter of personal allegiance for many than it is of policy. And what that means in this election is that the result is likely to be decided by the ability of a handful of feudal overlords to command the loyalty of their subjects. In this election, the struggle between the warlords has grown so momentous that the church has involved itself directly. On Easter Sunday, Manila's Cardinal Jaime Sin issued a pastoral letter to be read out in churches around the country. Christ wants us to share in his victory, but we will share in it only if, like him, we struggle against evil. For the Cardinal, a long-time backer of President Cory Aquino, this campaign was nothing less than a struggle between good and evil. 
and he made it crystal clear that the forces of evil were not only represented by Imelda Marcos, the widow of the hated dictator, hoping to regain the spoils of office through the ballot box. No one seriously gives her a chance. Cardinal Sin's real target was a far more dangerous enemy. Those who practice crony capitalism during the past regime to the detriment of our people who have, have no place in the high public offices of our land. To vote them into office would be to share in their crookedness. Ang leader ng bansang Pilipino, ang presidente ng Pilipinas, si Danding Pohuanco. This is the man Cardinal Sin wants to keep from the presidency, the man the Catholic Church regards as evil incarnate. His name is Eduardo Danding Cuenco. His followers call him the boss. His enemies call him Crocodile Danding. Despite the church's opposition, Danding is a front runner. There's a real chance this election could make him president. And whether or not he wins at the polls, Kowanko is manoeuvring to regain his place as the country's most powerful businessman. When Ferdinand Marcos fled the Philippines, Danding Kowanko went with him. But that was six years ago, and memories are short in Manila. Now, Danding is not only back, He's running for Marcos's old job. No, uh, it's not for me to judge. Uh, what I can say is I do not qualify as a crony, and uh, I don't think I have anything to be ashamed of insofar as my conduct was uh, in my association with Marcos, with our people. Kawanko has done few media interviews since this one with the ABC's Late Line in February. Despite three weeks of requests, he declined four corners offered to participate in this program. In his place came Kowanko's vice presidential running mate, the film star, Joseph Erap Estrada. When I tell you to do something, you do it, right? Wrong. Wrong, stupid your ass. Because I'm Filipino, you're pushing, pushing me around. You go to sleep now, white monkey. Estrada has spent his film and political career representing the poor and dispossessed of Philippine life. Now teamed up with Danding, he's defending the rich and powerful. Cronism is, uh, I would say, uh, the different definition of cronism. They're bad cronies and they're good cronies. And What's one a good of the good crony? cronies... Huh? What's a good crony? One uh, good crony is that one who does not take advantage of, he, of his being close to the president. It's, it's risible. I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. Kowanko was the epitome of the cronies. Let's put it this way. Marcos' own brothers and sisters stayed in the Philippines when, 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 the, when the Marcos regime fell when the Edsa revolution was pounding at the gates of the palace, when the mobs were surrounding Malacanang Palace, Marcos fled, he took his wife with him, he took his children with him, he left his own beloved brothers and sisters, he was very close to his relatives, because he knew that they, in fact, were not that close to him, that people wouldn't punish them. But he took, and the U.S. Embassy made sure that he took, Danding Kowanko. Danding Kowanko was, was more of a crony than Marcos' own siblings. He was at the epicenter of the administration. In 1986, Cory Aquino was swept into the presidency on a tide of people's power. I am Salvador H. Laurel, 
are taking power in the name and by the will of the Filipino people. It was a time of glorious optimism for the Philippines, of hope for a better and fairer society. Six years on, with little material change in the lives of the landless masses, Mrs. Aquino is drifting out of power amid criticism of her failure to do more. And there are real fears that after this election, with Mrs. Aquino gone, the Philippines could return to corrupt politics and crony capitalism. Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth of a series of presidential and vice presidential debates entitled Six Sundays. The four major topics for today's debate are peace, security, and human rights, social and cultural issues, economy and patrimony, politics and government. The questions for the debates were formulated... The presidential front-runners haven't exactly set the campaign trail on fire. Cory Aquino's favoured candidate is Fidel Ramos. She backs him because he stayed loyal through six years of plots and coup attempts. But the Catholic Church opposes Ramos, who's a Protestant and tainted by his role as Marcos's martial law enforcer. Productivity, productivity and productivity. Starting at the level of the household or at the level of the family, that is a beneficiary. Mr. Ramon V. Mitra, presidential candidate of the Laban... For Ramon Mitra, it's the opposite problem. He has the church on side, but President Aquino doesn't trust him even though he's from her party. The empty chair is for Danding Kowanko. Uncomfortable with interviews, Kowanko is not a natural politician. But his strength is organization, not image. He didn't even turn up for this nationally televised debate. Our government has been able to achieve only 34% in the last three and a half years of its initial distribution target. If you believe the opinion polls, the front runner was the anti-corruption candidate, Miriam Defensor Santiago. But it's party machinery, and often outright bribery, not opinion polls, that win votes in the Philippines, as historian Al McCoy discovered in the 1988 local poll. For example, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was in the polling place of precinct number one, La Carlota Elementary School, in the downtown of the city. And I stood at the head of a long queue of voters. All of these young voters were lined up. The Philippines is a very young population. And I speak the local language of that area because I've been going there now for about nearly 20 years. And I called out with a kind of brashness or brusqueness that's distinctively American. I said, uh, has everybody been paid today? Have we all got our money? And everybody began to laugh, laugh a little bit. And I said, come on, show me your bank notes. Wave them for me. And everybody reached in their pocket. And suddenly down this long queue of voters, there was this flickering flutter of this line of crisp technicolor 20 peso notes fluttering in the air. And you could do that in any polling place in that city and indeed in that province and throughout much of the entire Philippines on that election day. And that was only local elections. As you rise up in the scale of political office, the stakes increase and so do the payments. People power has not brought the people prosperity. Millions in the Philippines still live in poverty and squalor. In conditions like this, it would be surprising if votes could not be bought and sold for a few dollars a time. And this time around, there's a record number of candidates tussling for the people's vote. All the parties deny it, but the banknotes have been changing hands. Kawanko's people are loud in their denials of corruption. They say even if he wanted to pay for votes, his assets are frozen by the government. According to the party line, this is Kawanko's only major business, a concrete factory. What Imelda Marcos was to the world of shoes, you could say Danding Kawanko was to lethal weapons. When he fled with the Marcoses in 1986, police seized literally hundreds of guns from Kawanko properties around the Philippines. This was just one of them, northern cement, about three hours' drive north of Manila. 
This is about as close as we can get at the moment because of the Kowanko family security guards. But here, in 1986, police seized more than a dozen automatic weapons, including a belt-fed machine gun, pistols, revolvers, 50,000 rounds of M16 rifle ammunition, and hundreds of flare cartridges, smoke grenades, and blasting caps. It was 1989 when Danding Kowanko slipped back into the Philippines, just weeks before this bloody coup attempt, which brought Cory Aquino's government to the brink of collapse. Once back in the country, the ultimate crony capitalist was able to resume life almost as if Marcos had never fallen. This tropical paradise is Bugsuk Island, and every square metre belongs to Danding Kowanko. It's just one of his many fiefdoms in the Philippines. Four Corners has established that in the middle of the election campaign, police seized another mini arsenal, two M79 grenade launchers and 30 M16 rifles from Kowanko's loyal employees here. And we discovered in his exile years, Philippines and American intelligence monitored Kowanko's contacts with arms dealers and mercenaries in the United States. Even the Presidential Commission on Good Government, the PCGG, Cory Aquino's anti-corruption agency, goes in fear on Bugsuk. When they took these pictures, they were accompanied by the military. Uh, when our team of uh, PCGG uh, had to take a physical look of the premises, they had to be preceded, preceded by a contingent of Marines before they are allowed to went in for security reasons. At the southern tip of the island of Palawan, Bugsuk is far from Manila and far from central government control. We came here to Palawan with a letter from the Presidential Commission on Good Government, which has sequestered Kowanko's assets on Bugsuk, and with a directive from the commander of the Philippines National Police to give us a military escort onto the island. The military here, however, refused to take us, on the grounds that Kowanko's people on Bugsuk would not allow them to land. That is the extent of this man's power. Lawyer David Castro heads the Presidential Commission on Good Government. At the centre of his work is Operation Shamrock, focused on the extraordinary financial exploits of Danding Kowanko. Four Corners was given extensive access to Operation Shamrock. In thousands of pages of investigations, it reveals a complex web of Kowanko deals leading to a massive monopoly. As far back as the early days of Marcos, Danding Kowanko saw that coconuts were one of the great staples of the Philippine economy. The oil was an international raw material for everything from soap to ice cream. One third of Filipinos, 20 million people, mostly dirt poor peasants, made their living from the coconut industry. In 1974, with a stroke of the pen, Ferdinand Marcos gave his friend Danding Kowanko the monopoly on the whole country's hybrid coconut seed. He is going to reimpose regulations of the coconut industry. Emmanuel Pelaez was one of the few who dared criticize Kowanko during the Marcos years. A coconut planter and former Philippines vice president, he's now the Philippines ambassador to Washington. But he's thrown diplomacy aside to oppose Danding Kowanko's run for the presidency. Kowanko convinced the president that we should cut all the existing coconut trees and replant and replace them with this one single hybrid of which he was the sole producer. So he would have a monopoly on all coconut seeds in Absolutely. the Philippines? Uh, the late President Marcos went, so, went as far as issuing a decree that the Philippine Coconut Authority, which is supposed to engage in the promotion of the coconut, could not engage in the production of seeds commercially. So he handed it all to Kowanko? Of course, of course. Kowanko's Bugsuk seed farm didn't just have a monopoly, 
it was a gigantic state-subsidized monopoly. The investigations show that the farm was set up with a grant worth some 60 million US dollars. Kowenko also got the exclusive rights to sell all his seed nuts for five years to the same government authority which paid the money to set him up in the first place. When President Marcos, under heavy political pressure, eventually ended the coconut seed monopoly in 1982, it became clear the contract had been written so Kowanko could not lose. He not only did not lose, but he filed a claim for damages. He filed a claim for 958 million, so that it was, it was almost a billion. And was he filing that claim against an independent authority? Well, he was filing it against the United Coconut Planters Bank, of which he was the, uh, the CEO and the chairman. So he was both the plaintiff and defendant? Yes. Did he pull off what the PCGG describes as a scam involving the island of Bugsuk, which again netted him millions and millions of pesos? Well, that's, those are only uh, politically motivated charges. They're just doing it right now, especially our ambassador to Washington. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know why he uh, let himself be used by this administration. It's all politically motivated. It's just because that Mr. Kohanko is uh, leading the presidential survey now. So all the attacks on Mr. Kohanko are politically motivated? Yes, that's right. Pardon? At the Anti-Corruption yeah. Commission, they're supposed to have frozen the assets yeah. of the crony capitalists under public control while the court cases are decided. But up against the sharpest lawyers in town, the operations division is pathetically underfunded and under-resourced. The courts, however, can't be relied on to go in his favour, and Kowanko is a man who prefers to bet on certainties. So Danding Kowanko is running for president. Ako po'y nagsumikap na makauwi upang maharap ko itong mga taong nag-aakusa sa akin ng mga akusasyong kanilang pinagsasabi sa inyo. Dahil ako po ay taas noong humaharap sa bayan, taas noong humaharap sa inyong lahat ngayong gabi nito. Already in the campaign, Kawanko has said that as president, he wants to keep his businesses. He sees no conflict of interest in one of the country's richest businessmen also being head of government. He's claimed that he would not interfere in court cases against him. His running mate, Erap Estrada, on the other hand, sees no prospect of President Kowanko ever being taken to court. As president, will he allow the cases to proceed? Well, I think... Uh that is automatic exoneration by the people, who is voted by the people. That means that the people does not believe the charges against him. So if he's voted president, then the Presidential Commission on Good Government charges will be dropped? I believe so. And I'm, I, I myself, as a senator, I filed a bill uh, to, to abolish the Presidential Commission on Good Government. These pictures, taken in Kowanko's heyday under Marcos, show his Australian stud farm near Mudgee, Guri. It was valued at between 25 and 35 million dollars. All this belonged to a man who Philippine government investigators say had a taxable income over a decade of only 10 to 15 million dollars. The U.S. ambassador at the time estimated Kowanko's real value at up to one billion dollars. 
Van Ding's wife, Soledad Gretchen Coanco, opened a Swiss bank account with the firm of Lombard Odier and Company in June 1985. Government investigators estimate the account contained six to seven million US dollars. These, never before seen on television, are the documents Mrs. Coanco signed at the Swiss bank. These signatures gave Danding Coanco power of attorney over the account. The documents, for instance, uh, showing Mrs. Coanco's Swiss bank account that the PCGG put out, are those fabricated? They cannot show it. So those are fabricated. They, they don't have the document to prove that. Well, I've seen the documents. I have copies of the documents. Are they fabricated? I believe so. And uh, they could file the necessary charges if they think that uh, that is authentic uh, document. It was through a tax levied on poor farmers, not growing coconuts, that Danding Kowanko made his big money. The foundation of his fortune was a government levy of about 15 pesos, two dollars, for every hundred kilos of coconut meat or copra. This was in the 70s, when 15 pesos was nearly half a week's wages for the average coconut farmer. President Marcos imposed the levy, but denied that it was, in fact, a tax on the poor. Instead of the farmers paying it direct, Cahuanco arranged for the coconut levy to be imposed here at the mill, to be paid by the millers and exporters. In fact, many of the coconut farmers never realized at all that they were paying a coconut levy. But paying it they were, however indirectly. Over about a decade, the money taken from the farmers piled up, nine and a half billion pesos in all. And almost half the coconut levy money, by Marcos's decree, would be put in Coanco's bank. So the coconut farmer's money was compulsorily put into the UCPB, the coconut planter's bank. Yes, compulsorily placed there by uh, decree. But the coconut farmers were getting no interest for it. The, uh, the money deposited doesn't earn interest, and also that is by decree. By Marcos's decree. By Marcos's decree. From tiny beginnings, coconut levy money turned the United Coconut Planters Bank, the Coco Bank, into one of the biggest in the country. At Coco Bank, Dan Ding was the boss. Well, we have evidence to show that uh, many of the businesses uh, and enterprises of Mr. Cuanco, <coughs> which either manages or control, had borrowed interest-free also from, so, from this money. So it was just like his personal pot of money? Uh, that's the effect. By devious means, by buying back the shares of uh, the farmers, he accumulated 79% control of the bank. Over the time of the Marcos era? During the Marcos era. These, these are figures which were taken by the Commission on Audits uh, shortly after uh, President Aquino took over. Danding's 17th floor suite at the bank is empty now. But as these photos taken by investigators show, he had his own private swimming pool and firing range. It was from here that Coanco built his monopoly. With Marcos's help, Danding Coanco, his friends and nominees, dominated all sectors of the coconut industry. They were buyers, sellers, millers, and even regulators all at once. Even when Joe Romero took over as Cory Aquino's representative on the Philippines Coconut Authority, the body that was supposed to police the industry, he found that the police and the policed had been one and the same. So the people who were supposed to be regulating so it were also the people, the people who were involved who in the scam. were the beneficiaries of these things, you know. So that is uh, what the scam is all about. You see, it's a takeover of the whole coconut industry by uh, over a dozen people, headed by Mr. Kovanko and Mr. Enrile, who uh, have uh, taken away about 10 billion of funds from the farmers. <laughs> 
Taranko and his associates created a milling cartel which would pay the farmers less and make a bigger profit. They did it by using coconut levy money to buy every mill they could lay their hands on, ending up with a crushing 93%. Government investigators now say the mill cartel ended up costing the Philippines about $60 million. In March 1982, the milling cartel faced a challenge that threatened to break its stranglehold. Emmanuel Pelayas, the coconut farmer and former Philippines vice president, decided to take them on. He organized with an exporter to offer the farmers a better price. The farmers were delighted. The word went away, it went on its own, and they were electrified. And the result? And the result was that they came, they sold directly, they got the good price, and the dealers would no longer deal with Unicom because they came to me. They said, if you will help us, I said, sure. And so for one or two weeks, Unicom could not buy Copra. So you had cut out the middleman? Yes. Three nights later, Pelias attended a dinner at this Manila hotel. In the climate of violence engendered by Marcos's martial law, his challenge to the milling cartel had got someone very angry. Leaving at around midnight, neither Pelias nor his driver thought to check for following cars in the Manila traffic. All went smoothly enough, until they reached the corner of Pelias's own street. In spite of my being saved, I still had six wounds, five wounds on my back and, and one, one, one here. Five bullets? Five bullets. The doctors extracted uh, three slugs, three slugs. The other two went out again. You must have been extraordinarily lucky to survive. Uh, I, I think it's divine providence. I think it was God's will. Elias's driver died instantly. Officially, the killers were never found. The only motive I can, I can think of is that I fought the, uh, the levy. And there are so many people, there were so many people making money out of that. It was a milking cow. So it could, it could, it could have been any one of them. Was it ever officially investigated? No, because uh, the next day, President Marcos called me up. I had hardly come to, and he says, Manny, I'm sure that this was done by the Muslims. And he issued a press release. So I knew then that he was covering up. The shooting forced Marcos into token reforms, but essentially the coconut monopoly remained intact. And Kawanko, not satisfied with a monopoly at home, had decided to extend his stranglehold to the export market. The biggest buyers of coconut oil for everything from detergents to cakes, are in America. Rafael Fernando was the American representative for the Philippine oil exporters when Coanco and the cronies took over. Now Coanco's people ordered Fernando to corner the market in coconut oil and make the Americans pay. Well, the strategy was to control the prices and the supplies. Uh, by that I mean, uh, I, we received the instructions at the out outset to purchase all of the crude supplies, both afloat and on land in the U.S. All of it? All of it. To get a stranglehold to, to get on the market? To get a stranglehold on the market. So we purchased oil, uh, whether in Cap City, in New Jersey, or in Houston, Texas, or in... Uh, San Pedro Los, or San Francisco in California. For once in Coenco's extraordinary career, it was an all-out disaster. The strategy breached American law on monopolies and cartels, and Coenco rapidly found himself up against a criminal antitrust charge. It was ultimately scaled down to a civil charge, but Coenco's monopoly ended up having to pay $25 million compensation. And even commercially, the strategy flopped. What happened as a consequence of our activities was that uh, we had 
coconut oil flowing out of our ears. We had at, at that time we had more than 40,000 tons of crude coconut oil, which represented more than a month's supply for the entire U.S. Uh, market. Uh, we found our customers belligerent. They they told us to dump our coconut oil into the Pacific Ocean because they were not going to pay 42 cents per pound. And we uh, found a lot of substitution, which They went I, to other, other types of oil. They went it. to other types of oils, like grapeseed oil, like soybean oil, and so on. As a consequence, uh, there was a long-term adverse effect on Philippine coconut oil. The most authoritative study of rural conditions at the time concluded that an average Filipino farmer's income, only $20 a month, could have been close to 30 if it hadn't been for Coanco's monopoly. All the government investigations reveal that the monopoly's activities harmed the mass of poor Filipino farmers. Some did get scholarships and there were insurance policies and other benefits but the investigators say these were only tokens. Basic conditions, like the lack of running water in people's houses, stayed the same. Among all the Filipino businessmen, uh, Mr. Kohanko has the courage to take away the monopoly of uh, our coconut industry from the hands of the Americans. But didn't he create a monopoly for himself? No, I don't think... Well, I, I would say no. And at the same time, even assuming that he made a monopoly for himself, I would prepare it to be in the hands of the Filipinos, of or, or to any Filipino, than the, in the hands of a foreigner. There were moments in this election campaign when you'd have sworn the population was suffering from collective amnesia. At Danding Kawanko's rallies, it was as if the Marcos years had never existed. And all the analysts were predicting that despite his past, Kawanko was one of the undisputed front runners. By the end, it looked as if the man to beat could be the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Ramon Mitra. Like Danding, he has a powerful organization. Unlike Kowanko, he picked up the incalculable benefit of an endorsement from Cardinal Sin and the Catholic Church. But evidence obtained by Four Corners suggests that a Mitra victory might not be a Kowanko defeat. This is Ramon Mitra's house on the island of Palawan. If it reminds you at all of North Queensland, that may be because Mitra, like Kowanko, has spent a great deal of time in Australia. In Australia, the two presidential rivals are good friends. They have a shared interest in livestock, and Mitra has made many cattle buying trips around Australia. In the late 1970s, Mitra was at a low ebb, politically and financially. He'd just been released from a stint as a dissident in one of Marcos's jails. But the person who got him back on his feet again was none other than Danding Kohanko, Marcos's good friend. And Four Corners has established that not only did Kohanko set Mitra up in the coconut business as a trader, he also arranged for a loan to him of one million pesos. Do you owe Kohanko a debt of gratitude? Yes, a personal debt of gratitude, yes. What does that mean then in the Philippine system, this utang nalob? Yes, I intend to pay him a personal debt of gratitude. Did he but lend you money in the late do. 70s? He, the bank did, uh, that he had, and I paid for it. But that has got nothing to do with our politics, because if it did, then I would have joined him with Marcos, but I did not. I continued to fight Marcos. And, when you and say I will uh, pay him a personal debt of gratitude uh, uh, when uh, I can. But uh, that has got nothing to do with governance. The phrase in Tagalog is utang na laob, a debt of the gut, a debt you feel very strongly, not intellectually, not emotionally, but you feel it, you feel it down here in your innards, in your intestines, and in your stomach. And a debt of gratitude 
is a debt that has to be repaid. Uh, it's a debt that, that can, in fact, be repaid. It's not an inexhaustible debt that goes on forever, but it's one that requires at least an equal and opposite favor in order to be discharged. Mitra says he's his own man, and he denies any intention of dropping the court cases against Kowanko if he wins the presidency. But sources close to Cory Aquino say the outgoing president deliberately withheld her endorsement from Mitra because she distrusts his link with Kowanko. Power and wealth are inextricably linked in Manila. If the court cases against Kowanko are dropped, or even if the prosecution doesn't get the backing and resources it needs, the chances are high that he'll be back in the money. And it's not just the coconut monopoly. It's all the other assets that Kowanko bought with the money. Assets like the San Miguel Brewery, which has over 90% of the Philippine beer market. Kowanko's lawyers are already working hard to regain his controlling interest on the San Miguel board, currently frozen by the government. This is the man who says if elected president, he will be chief executive of all sectors of the economy. The man whose own lawyer told Newsweek he was running for president to protect his own private interests. He may not win, but come what may in Philippine politics, it's almost inconceivable that Danding Kowanko will lose. He seems highly likely to regain his place as the most powerful business force in the country. There's one thing that I think we've learned about Dundee Kowanko watching him over the last 40 years during his career in business. The man has no restraint. Just as he can now run for office proclaiming himself not to be a crony, to have been an, a man of absolute integrity when he ran the coconut monopoly so he could justify no matter what he would do as president. Each year, the poor and devout of the Philippines volunteer to relive the crucifixion of a man in Palestine 2,000 years ago. It seems a grotesque, self-inflicted punishment for a people who have suffered so much already. They say that those who do not learn from their history are condemned to relive it. There was precious little evidence in this election campaign that Filipinos have learned the lessons of the Marcos era. They seem condemned to repeat over and over again the pattern of what has always been. As always in the Philippines, the victims will be the poor, the ignorant, and the dispossessed. Mark Colvin reporting. And that's all from Four Corners for this week. Don't forget to join Kerry O'Brien for Late Line at 10.30 tonight. I'll be back at 8.30 next Monday night with a new edition of Four Corners. Until then, good night.